Hispanic, but it made no difference to anybody at all. But Jim Hightower was elected uh, head of the Department of Agriculture a few years back, and um, he's the one that started the program here in Texas. And so it uh, gave us a way to determine what people might be using, because a lot of folks are sensitive to chemicals. And so there are these uh, reasons that uh, it is certified because it makes sure by, uh, through inspections and record keeping, which is tedious really, um, what is truly organic. Um, the term natural is just a free-for-all right now. It means uh, practically nothing. So um, it does divide us from the other guys, separates us from the ones who are doing it. But Omri, for example, uh, with all of the knowledge and experience that they have, for example, I tried to register my um, John's recipe. That seaweed and uh, fish emulsion and a whole assortment of other things that were 100% natural. But it can't be registered because they're saying, oh, you've got a new chemical there. By putting these things together, that's why you see very few liquid uh, fertilizers out there that are registered. They say, you've got a new chemical in here, so you can't be certified organic even though everything in there is organic. So it is a challenge to get through Omri. But um, uh, it is just a simple way of saying this was grown in a way that it builds the soil, that these soils are going to be available to uh, the children, the grandchildren, and, and seven generations after that. So it, it's, it's about that. I mean, that's the basic story of it. How to separate ourselves from the folks who say they're organic, don't really understand what it means, but they know there's a better market for it. To me, it just but, means growing. This guy has else. an opinion about yeah. that. I'd like to uh, have other folks uh, here, too. Yeah. <laughs> Study nature. Do what she's been doing for the past million years. She knows what she's doing. If you want good soil and you can't buy it from John or us or somebody else, go out in a virgin forest if you can find such thing, or a creek bottom, and get the top half inch of soil with all of the leaf mold and everything in it. You got pretty good stuff. What about government intervention with that? Oh, don't get John, take any more. Give him John. <laughs> well, as a consumer and not a bottler, I think there, there are a lot of different levels that we look for when we go shopping. Um, and I'm glad there are organic standards, and I'm glad they're certified organic growers. The first best thing is to grow it yourself, but probably we're not going to grow everything we eat. The second step is to buy it from people you know at the farmer's market, um, at places where you can find out where this food is coming from and where how it's grown and then beyond that you know I'm not going to find anybody selling homegrown oatmeal at my farmers market so I want to know that there is some standard and that's where the certified organic comes in and so as consumers I think it's a good thing I, think one I mean thing it's too not perfect but nothing we all need to do as consumers is stop demanding that every fruit and vegetable looks perfect that is where a lot of the really bad stuff started, is that we thought there was something wrong with it. If there was a little blemish on it, or if there was a bug bite on it, or anything like that. So I think a lot of this started when the farmer said, okay, if we're gonna produce you know, what the public wants, and they want a, want a perfect tomato, or a perfect okra, or a perfect head of broccoli, then they turned to using more and more and more pesticides to try to produce that perfect look. And let me tell you what, if you close your eyes, you can't tell a whole lot of difference than the taste of a tomato that's got a split on the surface or got a chunk taken out of it by a hornworm or something like that. And if you want to get more quality local produce out there, stop demanding that everything be a picture perfect piece of fruit or vegetable or whatever else that you buy. You get a whole lot better quality, in my opinion. Go ahead, Trevor Joe. John, 20 years ago, I sent for the package from Texas, about 20 years ago, to become, to look at becoming certified. And I, I literally, I got a, a package back that weighed five pounds, and I immediately turned it into compost. The best use is the process, have, have intelligent people replace bureaucrats, is the process to even get started, something that a normal person can handle without lawyers and all that stuff. 
Well, when I helped write those call lines, um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> we didn't know. No, it's okay. We we thought we were doing the right thing, and we were in reality. But it did get complicated, and that's what I mentioned a while ago for the farmers. They have to register each row, and when that crop comes and goes out of there, they have to talk about um, um, what they did and um, all of that. So um, what they used, everything. It, it did become uh, very complicated, and that's why I said to Malcolm he didn't want to get started on it. But when the government gets involved in these things, uh, that's a, a huge mistake. But that's who um, um, helped start it, you know. Like I mentioned Jim Hightower, because um, it wasn't because he was so much in office, but he did have an opportunity, and he wanted at that time to see this movement towards a more natural farming style take place. So we got together and created uh, these guidelines. We, did you help us with that? I think so, didn't you? Have some input? I don't remember. <laughs> Malcolm helped us with um, uh, putting that together because of the excellent information and the experience he had. But it did turn into that. And it took us three years to make a book that thick. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I just got through putting together a five-acre organic garden in Georgia. I just got back. We did get a lot of help. Georgia Organics is sort of like Texas Organic Farmer and Gardener, and they have complete guidelines that they give you. And I have to admit, I'm not a big paperwork man, but I think we finished the paperwork in three days. Then we sent it to the state. The state sends out a, uh, a guy to verify it. And he, uh, this, the good news we had was we were using a virgin territory. It had never been a garden before. That's the secret. <laughs> if you've already been a conventional gardener, it gets quite complicated and you've got to go so many years. And, but since we picked a piece of virgin area in the middle of a national forest that had never been sprayed or anything, all we had to do was conf to, to confine ourselves to the list of goods that they wanted us to use. To, and and uh, they okay to have okay. It's not okay yet. It takes a year even then to really get it going. But they okayed what we wanted to do in less than the two months that I was there. So I'm not saying it may be that easy here now, but I don't know why it wouldn't be. It actually is a federal standard. And maybe Tofka, Texas Organic Farmers, can, them can help you. But no, it is not that hard. Now, I'm not a commercial grower, folks. I'm not trying to grow 100 acres. This was a five-acre place. But uh, I was kind of... Unlike you, Joe, I thought I was going to have a whole lot more paperwork to wade through than I did have. It actually was something I filled out in two or three afternoons. And we had to send them the exact plots, as John said. We had to say we're going to plant this here and this here and how many. So it's not just nothing. But uh, they okay unless these, I hate to say this, unless these folks screw it up in the next year, they're on their way to having an organic garden. And it is certified organic with a sign of it. So I don't think it's that bad. Uh, Pepper Joe, we um, put on seminars that you can come to our office maybe every other month where we'll have a certifier explain all the rules, regulations. We'd be glad to let you know when the next one's going to be. Um, and the expenses of filing the papers are also reimbursed by grants from the government. Yeah, so it's, it's getting better, it's getting easier. I wanted to add something to what Bob said about uh, requiring or looking for the quality of what we buy, being a little more forgiving. Personal experience, we grew 50 acres of cabbage, uh, had a good contract for a great price. Um, got about a third of the way through the harvest and the price on the market of cabbage dropped. So the buyer looks for every way he can to get out of the contract. There was a little bitty brown spot down by the core that I couldn't find, but he could show me. He walked away from the field because he said his buyer may disregard or reject the, uh, the cabbage. We have probably a million heads of cabbage left. I love sauerkraut. That's me too. <laughs> Let me thank you, folks. I'm gonna, I got to go to a radio show and I've got to drive home because I didn't have the equipment with me, but I want to thank you and I'm sure glad I got invited again. Thank you, all. Thank you, Bruce, for being here. And I know a lot of people have places to go. Uh, we'll wrap up this afternoon uh, just by asking the panel are there anything, any questions you wish had been asked or anything you meant to say and forgot to? I just covered it with my cabbage story. <laughs> John? Well, I hope your lawn dies. 
so that you can get out there and start growing some vegetables. Every time someone calls me out in the air and says, I've got a round patch, and says, how big is it? Says, that's big enough to plant some tomatoes in. I no longer try to address the lawn problems. Um, we have water issues, we have uh, pollution issues, uh, the weed and feed that's used out there is horrible product, and the city of Austin's recommended that we don't use it. Atrazine has become a major problem on farms, and that, those are reasons to buy organics, but um, get out there.